to the people. All power to the people. All power to the people. Right on. Our people from the black community and the mother country can have uh, their cameras and tape recorders. But people from the pig press is not allowed in here with no cameras, tape recorders, or either movie cameras. Now it'll be some. Now it'll be some uh, revolutionaries in here that will be making films of this, you see, and making tapes of this, or show uh, how the things are. Okay, so y'all just bear with that. On Friday, September 4th, the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention began a four-day plenary session in Philadelphia to begin the drafting of a new United States Constitution. Over 10,000 people, mostly young, about half white, converged on the Temple University Gymnasium where mass meetings took place, and the Church of the Advocate, an Episcopal church in the nearby North Philadelphia ghetto, where the convention's activities were coordinated. The convention was called and organized by a coalition of radical groups led by the Black Panther Party. The atmosphere in Philadelphia as the convention began was tense. The previous weekend, a rash of apparently unprovoked police shootings left one Philadelphia patrolman dead and three others wounded. Suspects in some of the shootings were black. Two nights later, the three Philadelphia headquarters of the Black Panther Party were raided by police in search of illicit weapons. And in the accompanying gunfire, three more policemen were wounded. The headquarters were thoroughly searched and furniture was taken from the buildings by the police. Fourteen Panthers were arrested and a group of them were taken to the police station in order to strip naked in the street outside to be searched. Photographs of the search appeared in newspapers nationwide and tension in Philadelphia mounted. Police Commissioner Frank Rizzo, known for his tough law and order policies, ordered the Panther offices restored but denied having apologized for the raids. As the convention got underway, a Philadelphia judge issued an injunction restraining the Philadelphia Police Department from violating the constitutional rights of the convention participants. Police Commissioner Rizzo said standard police procedures were within the bounds prescribed by the court injunction. Throughout the convention, the Philadelphia police remained scarce. Friday was devoted to registration of delegates at the Church of the Advocate and organization of food and housing arrangements. Temple University contributed the use of its new gymnasium, but no other facilities were offered by or demanded of the university. Security arrangements by the Panthers were extensive. Cameras and tape recorders were not permitted inside the Church of the Advocate, and all parcels were searched or confiscated at the entrance to the church. The first formal meeting of the plenary session took place at the Temple Gymnasium on Saturday afternoon. It had been scheduled for 9 o'clock in the morning, but because of delays in setting up the floor and the necessity to thoroughly search all delegates who entered the hall, the meeting was delayed until afternoon. The establishment press was excluded completely. The meeting was devoted to an opening speech by Michael Tabor of the New York Panther 21. Tabor spoke for over two hours, holding the convention spellbound for the duration of his address and frequently being interrupted by cheers and applause. In his speech, Tabor outlined the historical context of the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention and enunciated most of the political themes which were to dominate the weekend. The speech will be broadcast in full on WBAI in the future. For this program, it has been condensed to about half its original length. Here then is tape from the first session of the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention plenary session. We're going to have our uh, introductory speaker who will open things up, Michael Tabor. I uh, think it would be appropriate at this time to say all power to the people, all power to the people. One of the problems in our society today is that there are far too many people. There are far too many people who still labor under the delusion that America is a free and democratic society. I don't know. It's a mind blower. It's a mind blower when you have tens of millions of people in this society dying from starvation. It's a mind blower when you have 
the government and the army of this country dropping napalm bombs all over the world. It's a mind blower when people can be starving and dying every day and there's still people running around talking about America is free. That's a mind blower. And we got to straighten that out. We got to straighten that out. <laughs> And when we check that phenomena out, we find that the primary reason why so many people feel that way, why so many people think that America is free, is because while we were in school, while we were in school, we were fed a steady and heavy diet of bullshit consisting of praise and glory or glorification. We were fed a diet that said that America is right on that America is the most equitable society, that America is the most humane and just society on the planet. When we were in school, they told us, when you dig it, when you think about it, when you think about it, they told us how the government is supposed to work. They told us about the anatomy of the government, but they didn't tell us how it really works. They didn't tell us about the physiology of the government. They didn't tell us that this government, from its very inception, was never a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, that from Jump Street, from the get-go, it was a government of the pigs, by the pigs, and for the pigs, and that the people have never had no power in this society. When we objectively check out the facts and the history of this country, we find that about 200 years ago, a racist by the name of Thomas Jefferson, way back in 1776, sat down and wrote a document that has gone down in history as being one of the most eloquent and one of the most uh, uh, glorious documents ever formulated, ever drawn up. And in that document, it asserts that all men have an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It goes on to say, and that was a hell of a wolf ticket at that time. That was a hell of a wolf ticket. It was a hell of a wolf ticket because the individuals who said it at that time constituted nothing but a two-bit two and a chump-ass colony. And they were being dominated, they were being oppressed by the so-called British Empire headed by King George. So not only did they sell a wolf ticket to the effect that every man has a right to uh, determine the cost of his own destiny, but they went on to say that whenever, whenever any form of government comes down foul, when they begin misusing, when they begin exploiting, when they begin oppressing the people, and when they show beyond a doubt or contradiction that they have no intention of righting those wrongs, then the people have a right to off them, to off them. That's what it says. <laughs> but when we check out that document further, and we weigh that document against the reality of the situation at that time, we find that back in 1775, when it was hooked up, they said all men were created equal. All men were created equal. Now, a lot of people never gave that no thought. But the fact of the matter is, black people at that time weren't considered people at all. We were property. We were property. Women weren't considered people at all. It didn't say nothing about all men and all women are created equal. It just said all men. It just said all men. But even in that document there, as quiet as it's kept, one portion was left out. In the original draft, there was a part that went to the effect of King George was guilty of transporting and enslaving a people who had never done him any harm. And that was a crime against humanity. But the strangest thing happened when that document, the Declaration of Independence, was finally published. That part wasn't in it. That part wasn't in it. And for a very good reason, because that indictment against King George, made by George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, uh, uh, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and the rest of those pigs, not only was that a valid indictment against King George, but it was also a valid indictment against the very individuals who wrote it, because they were slave masters themselves. So we see the contradiction right there. And so they hooked up their document. So they say they had to be free. They said it was wrong to, to be taxed without having uh, uh, adequate representation. They petitioned, they boycotted, they even had a tea party. They were so cowardly in their tea party that they didn't even take credit for it. They were so racist that they blamed it on the Indians. 
finally, as so often is the case in history, push came to shove. Push came to shove, and there was no denying any longer that in order for them to be free, they would have to go to war. They would have to fight. So they picked up the gun as a last resort, and they told the British Empire to come on with it. That they ran down to us, that they fought nobly, that they fought valiantly, that they were courageous, but that was bullshit. They was punks because George Washington fought that whole war in retreat. <laughs> and the only reason the suckers was able to win was because Holland, France, and Spain declared war on England at the same time. And that's a hell of a historical lesson because any time, we've seen it time and time again in history. We saw it with Hitler, we saw it with Napoleon, and we saw it back there uh, during the so-called American Revolutionary War. That uh, uh, no, no nation in the world can fight more than, uh, can fight wars on several fronts. And that's why they blew, because they was trying to take care of business all over the world. They were trying to enslave and oppress people all over the world, and they got jammed. So okay, they say that George and them chumps won. And then they went on back in, then they came up to 1787, and they sat down here in this so-called city of brotherly love. Brotherly love, can you dig that, brotherly love? <laughs> How can there be any love in a city where this fascist dog gives orders to his police to raid the homes of not only Black Panthers, but brothers and sisters off the street? who were helping in the registration for the people here to come when, he's given the order, when he gave the order to raid their homes, to shoot them down in cold blood, to drag them out of their homes and stand them up against the wall and have them to strip buck naked. That reminds us of slavery. That reminds us of slavery. He told them to strip. <laughs> How can there be any love in a city we're, we're such inhuman and barbaric acts are allowed to go unpunished. If there's any love here in this city at all, it is manifested right here in the, in the, in the gymnasium of Temple University. This is where the love is at. This is where it's at. And so the founding fathers sat down back in 1787, and they said they were going to make a government they said they were going to draw up a constitution. They, saw they, they said they were going to make laws for people to live by. But when we check out that document that they hooked up, and when we check out the personalities who were down with the formulation and the drafting of the constitution, we find that in actuality, they were not so freedom loving. They were not so righteous. They were not so humane after all. We find that the Founding Fathers consisted of individuals such as Alexander Hamilton, who referred to the masses of the people as being the beasts. We find that it consisted of individuals who were so democratic and so freedom-loving that they felt that the senators and the president should hold their office forever. <laughs> we find that it consisted of individuals like George Washington, who's documented as having sold a slave for a keg of molasses. We find that it consisted of individuals such as Thomas Jefferson, who was supposed to be the most freedom-loving out of that whole bunch. He was the most freedom-loving, and he was a slave master. So that's the type of individuals who hooked up the government. That's the type of individuals who created the society and who drafted the Constitution. And what were the positions of these individuals? What class did they come from? They weren't slaves. They couldn't have been slaves because they owned slaves. They owned property too. They controlled the shipping. They controlled the industry. They controlled every aspect and every sector of the economy at that time. They were quite simply the ruling class, the ruling class. And when they sat down to draft that document, they had one thing in mind and that was creating a society that would enable them to protect their property rights, creating a society that, will le that would legalize their uh, enslavement of black people, creating a society that would enable them to create an army to guarantee that the masses of the people did not rip their stolen wealth off. They were all about creating a society not based on freedom, justice, and equality for the people, but rather creating a society that would enable the pigs to perpetrate their madness throughout all of this country. When that document was hooked up at that time in 1787, there were approximately six 
600,000 black people in this country. There were approximately 300,000 Indians, 300,000 because they had offed over half of them by that time. There were approximately 240,000 indentured slave uh, servants, and there were I don't know how many women, and none of those people, none of them were included in that document. As a matter of fact, in the Constitution, when it was originally drawn up, in three separate sections, the issue of slavery was dealt with. In one section, the first one, it stated that black people would constitute not a human being, not a 100% human being, but rather three-fifths of a man. How can you be three-fifths of a man? They said we were three-fifths of a human being. And they figured they was giving us a play at that because before they sat down and did that, we wasn't considered no part of a human being. Those Indians, those Indians had no rights whatsoever. The indentured servants and the women had no rights whatsoever. That whole document was about doing nothing other than just being able to create a society where they could rob, steal, plunder, and just go crazy. And this is exactly what they did. It's interesting to note that it was not until the year 1791 that the pigs were forced to sit down and include the so-called Bill of Rights. That section of the, of the Constitution, which supposedly, we got to emphasize that supposedly, supposedly guarantees certain liberties to every man, woman, and child who is a citizen of this country. It guarantees that they have a right to assemble. It guarantees that they have freedom of speech, freedom of the press. It guarantees them the right to bear arms and to defend their homes against attackers. It goes on to point out that they cannot be uh, arrested and thrown into jail and have uh, uh, an excessively high bail thrown on them. It guarantees them so many things. When we look at it, it seems some kind of beautiful, but when we check out the reality of it, we find that nowhere in America do any of these things exist. And it was not until the non-propertied whites, the poor whites of this society, got together and threatened to start another war, threatened to start another revolution if George Washington and them creeps didn't get down and hook up that Bill of Rights. And so the years passed by, and black people remained in a state of total bondage, of total enslavement. 1850 rolled around, and they said the Supreme Court, now the Supreme Court plays a very key role in this society because they are the ultimate interpreters of the Constitution. There is a misconception that exists in the minds of many people that the Supreme Court operates and functions independently of any outside pressures. They're like supposed to be above and beyond politics. Now, I don't know how anybody could uh, come up with an idea like that, but uh, a lot of people think that. A lot of people think that Supreme Court decisions come from the hand of God. They were written, for, written by the Almighty up above. And in 1850, that Supreme Court sat down and said, that any slave who escapes from one state or from one section of the country and who goes to another must be returned. That's what they thought about us. In 1857, Chief Justice Taney of the Supreme Court of this country handed down a historic decision that said that black people or black man has no rights which a white man is bound to respect. That was back in 1857 and nothing has changed. That situation has remained the same. Now, we come up to this creep by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln said something that was very hip and we should all take heed of it. He said you could fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. <laughs> and Lincoln should have known because he did a damn good job of fooling four million black people in this country at the time that when he sat down and wrote that Emancipation Proclamation that that freed us. Four million of us went for that bullshit. Four million of us. That's what they ran to us in school. But when we check out history, when we check it out, we find that Abraham Lincoln did not sign the Emancipation Proclamation because he sincerely and honestly felt that black people should be freed. Oh, no, that's not the reason why that chump signed that document. He signed it out of political and economic necessity. That's how it came down. Because when we check out the history of this country, we find that the South at that time, on January the 1st, 1863, when he issued that document, the South was putting fire to the North's ass. They was giving them a righteous ass whipping. Abraham Lincoln, 
Lincoln and the Northern generals had to come up with a scheme that would infect uh, diminish the power of the South, that would undermine their military strength. So what did Lincoln did? He sat down and said that all of those states that have broken away from, uh, from, from the Union and who refused to come back, that the slaves in those states are free. Now all we have to do is look at that and we see that that's absolute madness. That's ridiculous. Because first of all, the states had, they had broken away from the Union, the Confederate states. Now, Abraham Lincoln had no power over those states. So how in the hell could he free slaves that he had no power over? He didn't free them. Then it goes on, the contradiction becomes even greater when we check it out because he said that in those states, those states who had broken away from the Union but who were coming back and who would be loyal to the Union, they could keep those slaves. They could keep their slaves. So in effect, what he did was he freed those slaves which he didn't have no power to free and he kept in slavery those that he did have the power to free. And it was, in fact, because of the heroic effort, because of the fighting spirit and the spirit of sacrifice manifested by those 186,000 black men who fought in the Civil War, laboring under the delusion that by fighting and laying their blood down for this country to preserve the Union, that they get some freedom. The only reason why the North won was because of those black soldiers. That's the only reason. And then they came together in Congress. Congress at that time was dominated by the Republican Party, by the Republican Party. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. At that time, the Republicans had a reputation of being the liberals. They had the reputation of being the radicals, Thaddeus, Thaddeus Stevens and all them other funny time chumps. They were supposed to be the revolutionaries at that time. But when we check it out a little further, we find that all of the laws, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that were enacted by Congress and that supposedly gave black people uh, freedom, that supposedly gave black people the right to uh, uh, citizenship, and that supposedly gave black people the right to vote, we find that none of those laws were passed as a result of a sincere uh, uh, desire on the part of the government of this country to repay to black people what they had stolen from them. No, none of those reasons accounted for what they did. The main reason why we got the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment was because at that time the Republicans were representing the interests of the northern capitalists, of the financiers, of the industrialists, and of the bankers. They wanted to control the entire country. They wanted to expand their power. They wanted to move into the West and set up railroads. They wanted to build industries, but they realized in order to do that, they would have to have absolute control of the government. They would have to have absolute control of the government. And as long as the Southern Democrats were in power, that control was impossible. So what did they do? They said, well, we'll give black people the right to vote. We make black people citizens. And behind Abraham Lincoln freeing them, and behind Abraham Lincoln being a Republican, they knew goddamn well that black people would pledge their allegiance to the Republican Party. And that's what we did. That's what we did. They had what they call reconstruction, reconstruction. Now, anyone here today who is under the delusion that the problems, the economic, political, and social problems that afflict black people can be solved by way of having black representatives functioning in the traditional political arena, anyone who believes that all you have to do is look back at Reconstruction. Black people had what was called political representation at that time and it didn't get us a goddamn place. As a matter of fact, during the Reconstruction era, black people sent two senators, two senators to the, uh, uh, to the Senate and from all places they came from Mississippi. During Reconstruction there were 20 black representatives to Congress. During Reconstruction, there were blacks who served as associate judges on the state court. There were blacks who served as mayors. There were blacks who served as DAs. There were blacks who served as police commissioners. There were blacks who functioned on damn near every level of, of the local, state, uh, and federal government. But when, but when the ruling class in this society decided that black people had outlived their usefulness, all they did was they just squashed it all. And despite all of that so-called political representation, despite all of the so-called gains that we made during Reconstruction, despite all of that, when the year 1876 rolled around and it was necessary for Rutherford B. Hayes, who was uh, the Republican uh, candidate for the presidency at that time, when it was necessary for him to capture the necessary votes to win that election, all he did was he formed a deal. He made a deal with the Southerners and that ended Reconstruction. That squashed that. And the next day we found ourselves in a worse trick bag than we were in uh, doing slavery. Slavery had been ushered back upon the stage of American history and it has remained until this very day. Every dealing, 
every form of relationship that we have had to this society. That applies to black people. That applies to Puerto Rican Americans. That applies to Mexican Americans. That applies to Indians. That applies to Eskimos. That applies to poor whites. That applies to women. Every dealing that every one of those groups has had with this government has resulted in nothing more than a lot of meaningless promises made, and nothing came of those promises, and the end result was a flim flam and more persecution and more oppression. Every promise that they've made has only served to put us asleep. In the year 1896, that prestigious and august body, the most powerful judiciary body in the world, the Supreme Court of the United States sat down, handed down a ruling. It was called the Plesley versus Ferguson decision. A brother by the name of Plesley from down in Louisiana hopped on a train and he sat in the, in the section that was reserved for whites. And the conductor came along and told him he had to move because black people could not sit in that section. So Plesley took it to court. And when it reached the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal accommodations were constitutional and were fair. That is known as Jim Crow, as Jim Crow. In 1954, the Supreme Court supposedly squashed the Jim Crow law by outlawing segregated schooling. Here we are 16 years later, and over 90% of the black children in the South still attend inferior and segregated schooling. So that's how much rhythm we get out of the Supreme Court. That's how much rhythm we get out of the Constitution. That's where that's at just been fooled too goddamn much and too goddamn long and their eyes are opening up veil after veil of illusion veil after veil has been uh, uh, lifted from their eyes and now they're standing and they're taking a cold hard objective look at what america is all about they're looking at that flag up there that they once thought of as being the uh the symbol of freedom justice and equality they're looking at that flag now, now they don't think of it in those terms. When they look at that flag now, they don't think about freedom, justice, and equality. They think about slavery, racism, oppression, and imperialism. They look at that flag now, and on the other end of the social uh, uh, scale, on the other end of the spectrum, you have those whose mentalities are so perverted and so depraved that they say, you can do anything, but just don't spit at my flag. Because if you spit at my flag, I'll kill you. That's insanity. That's insanity. A lot of us are hung up. A lot of us are hung up because we can only visualize, we can only see fascism in terms of Nazi Germany or fascist Italy. We can only see fascism, we can only think of fascism when we see herds of stormtroopers rolling down the street, goose-stepping and screaming thunderous Zeke howls. We can only see fascism when we look up and see an Adolf Hitler. We can only see fascism when we look up and see a Batito Mussolini. And until they see that, a lot of people are going to refuse to believe that America is fascist. Well, all I have to say about that is you can wait for the Zeke howls, you can wait for, for the goose-steps, you can wait for your Adolf Hitler, and by the time Time they arrive, it'll be too goddamn late because your ass will have been run into a concentration camp. <laughs> they don't need no Hitler in this country. They've gone quite a few better than Hitler. While we're talking about Hitler, that brings to mind a statement that Hitler once made. And I suspect that he got the idea from America because he stood up and said that if a lie is told long enough and strong enough, people in time will begin to believe it. And I'm sure he learned that from America because America has in fact ran down the longest and the strongest lie ever perpetrated in history. The lie that says America is a free and democratic society. That's the biggest lie ever told, the biggest lie ever told. A lot of people are still talking about the six million Jews that the Nazis exterminated. And they have forgotten about the 50 million black people. I don't know how many million Indians. I don't know how many, uh, how many million Mexicans. <laughs> They're still talking about those six million Jews, but they done just shot over the fact that during the era of slavery, America participated in the callous and cold-blooded extermination of 50 million black people. 
50 million. And that was just during the era of so-called uh, overt slavery. Now, I don't know how many more have been massacred. I don't know how many more have been lynched, burned, castrated, and murdered since that time up until now. I don't think there's enough numbers to account for it. So we got to stop talking about what America might do, what America might not do, because the fact of the matter is the issue ain't whether America would commit genocide. The reality of the situation is that America has been perpetrating genocide since the year 1607 when them racist bandits first landed on that rock, when they first set foot in Jamestown. They've been doing it since then. <laughs> We cannot look upon the United States of America as simply being a nation. The United States of America is far more than a nation. It is, in fact, the most ruthless, the most bloodthirsty, the most oppressive, and the most exploitative empire that has ever existed in the annals of history. The United States of America is, in fact, the number one, the number one threat to the continued existence of the human race. We have to understand that the forces that are presently in control of this government, and a lot of people think that Richard Nixon is in control of the government. Richard Nixon ain't in control of the government. Richard Nixon is merely a glorified functionary and flunky. <laughs> when we check out America economically, we find that the wealth of America exceeds that that was had by the pharaohs of Egypt. The wealth of America is greater than the wealth of the, the sultans of Baghdad. It's greater than the wealth of, of the Pope in the Vatican, and he got 12 billion. He got 12 billion that they know about, that they know about. <laughs> you take the wealth of the Rockefellers, which is estimated at being at $7.5 billion. You take the wealth of the DuPonts, their wealth is estimated at being in excess of $7 billion. You take the wealth of the Ford family, their wealth is in the billions. You take the wealth of the Pews who own U.S. Steel. You take the wealth of the Mellons who own Chrysler, Bethlehem Steel, Westinghouse Electric, you name it, they own it. You take their combined wealth and put it together and the pharaohs of Egypt, the sultans of Baghdad, and the Pope of the Vatican look like welfare recipients. That's what they look like. A so-called great military leader by the name of Dwight Eisenhower quite a few years ago said that we have to watch out for the military industrial complex. He was down with starting it. And then he came back and said, you got to watch out for it because it's done got out of hand, because it's getting out of hand. That was quite a few years ago. I think uh, just when he left office back in 1960, here it is 1970 now, and we don't have to watch out for it no more. We got to deal with it because it is in fact the force that controls this country. The power in this country now firmly rests in the hands of the Pentagon. It is in the Pentagon where all of the tax that are being perpetrated against the Black Panther Party and other progressive and revolutionary forces in this society and the American people in general, it is in the Pentagon where all of those activities are being centrally coordinated and it is there in the Pentagons that, that the, the orders emanate from. It's going down in the Pentagon. So we don't have to worry about them coming to power because they control the society. Between the, between the guns of the Pentagon and the wealth of the ruling families in this society, there exists a plan that is, in fact, the most barbaric and the most hideous scheme ever thought up in human history. Around the end of, uh, at the end of the World War II, they sat down and they dug. They dug that the most wealth, the greatest cash, could be made by uh, doing times of war, doing times of war. So what did they do? They dedicated themselves to the proposition that they would keep a war going on somewhere on the planet at all times. And what would they do? They would supply the military needs of those who were fighting. They signed military pacts with 42 different countries around the world. They have over a million uh, 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 armed forces stationed in over 30 countries around the world. 
They are waging war all over the world. And at the same time, they're going to stand up and tell people that they are all over the planet enslaving, exploiting, oppressing, and dehumanizing people because they want to make the world safe for democracy and freedom. Anybody who can believe that that's really why the United States has in the last five years dropped more bombs on Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam than all of the bombs dropped during World War II, if they can really think that that is being done to make the world safe for freedom and democracy, all we can say is that they are extremely ignorant, extremely ignorant, because all we have to do is look at the world situation today, and we find that from the islands of the Philippines to the swamps of Southeast Asia, to the tropical jungles of Africa, to the arid deserts of the Middle East, to the Bolivian tin mines, to the cities of South America, uh, on up into the colonized ghettos of Babylon, we find that all over the world, people have risen up and they're moving like a mighty tidal wave. And they're saying that it is our duty, it is our obligation to humanity to destroy that very force which is responsible for the enslavement of the planet. This is what they're saying. <laughs> They are saying that whatever must be done to destroy U.S. imperialism and capitalism and racism must be done. They are saying that no longer shall the struggle be waged by way of conducting it according to the rules and regulations laid down by the oppressor. They're saying no longer will they attempt to secure their, their, their human right to self-determination by, by, by doing it according to the way that the oppressor says it must be done. They are saying now that they will do it by any means necessary. If it means picking up a gun, they pick up the gun. This is what they're saying. <laughs> and the people of Asia, the people of South America, the people of Africa, the people all over the world, their eyes are focused on the United States of America at this time because they know far better than a lot of us here in Babylon know that the only force, the only power, the only group of people that are capable of dealing a death blow to the monster known as America are those who live right here within the belly of the beast. <laughs> they. They know that until the righteous people right here in Babylon begin to move in a unified and revolutionary fashion to destroy the society and create a new society that will not be based upon the depraved and mad dog barbaric ethic of dog eat dog, cat eat cat. You beat me today, I'll steal from you tomorrow, and the day after, we'll get together and stock it to blow Joe. Uh, 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 they know that in order to create a society wherein people can live in a harmonious and cooperative fashion with people, if they want to lay up and smoke some pot in peace, they can do that. If they want to lay up and make love, they can do that. If they just want to groove and be cool, they can do that. If they want to have uh, the right to determine the cost of their own destiny, they can do They got to do that. They got to do that. They know, they know, <laughs> they know that in order for any of those conditions to exist, that black people here in America, that Puerto Ricans here in America, that Mexicans here in America, that Chinese here in America, that Japanese here, that Eskimos, that poor whites, that women, that all oppressed groups here in America must unite must move in a revolutionary fashion, must assume an uncompromising stand, must never turn back, and must deliver a death blow to U.S. imperialism. They know that. They know it. They know it. <laughs> right on. Right on. Right on. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people! Power to the people! Power to the people! Power to the people!
Right on. America is crumbling and falling, and those who are in control of this society realize it. They realize that their empire is on the verge of becoming extinct. We see this happening. We see it happening in Vietnam, in a small Southeast Asian nation, where the people there have been fighting for over 40 years to gain their liberation. And we see, even in the most optimistic statements made by the administrators of this society and by the Pentagon, even in their most optimistic statements, it's obvious that America has lost that war. That war is over. It's over. It's over. But if they have won, why is there still fighting going on? They are taking care of business in their area. They are taking care of business. But there's still fighting going on, but the war has been won. Why? Why? Because here in America, here in America, we have not done our job yet. You see, that's where that's at. And we have to understand that. What confronts us today in America is this. A choice has been given to us, an ultimatum, which in effect says you will submit to, you will endorse, and you will not whisper one utterance of displeasure or disapproval at what is happening in this society. You will endorse murder on an international level. You will endorse racism, capitalism uh, here in America. They're saying that you will either endorse those things or you will have to pick up a gun and get what's yours. America has said to black people, America has said to all those in this country today who are determined, who are determined to be free, they say that if you want anything more than what America has historically given you, you're going to have to take it. You're going to have to take it. We say that whenever a people, any people, have been enslaved, exploited, oppressed, dehumanized, burned, lynched, castrated, and subjected to every other form of mistreatment conceivable to the human mind, we say that when all of that has been done to a people, anything that those people do to gain their freedom and to get that beast up off their back is justified. It's justified. And make no mistake about it. Anything, anything. Not only is it justified, but it is self-defense. It is self-defense. A lot of people are confused uh, about the whole issue of self-defense. It means if a pig moves on you today and he got a gun and you ain't got a gun, quite simply, you ain't in no position to be dealing with him. But it means, you know, if he does that at high noon, you're not in a position to deal with him. But come sundown, come sundown. And the streets are dark and deserted. And you go up on that roof. And you take your action out. And you fix up your sights. And you put your index on that trigger. And you see him and you pull that trigger. That's self-defense. That's self-defense. That's all it is. It's self-defense. It's self-defense quite simply because if you don't get him, he's going to get you the next day. That's why it's self-defense. That's why it's self-defense. We find that we are in a situation where we are confronted by enemies who have dedicated themselves to extinguishing us, to killing us, to offing us. Now, it boils down to a simple question of what are you going to do about that? If you are a masochist, then the answer is quite simple you will just allow your life to be snuffed out. You will allow them to kill you. And if you make that choice, then history cannot look upon you and will not look upon you as being a martyr, but they will look upon you as being a goddamn fool, a goddamn fool. <laughs> However, on the other hand, if you look at your situation and you say that I am confronted by an enemy 
who is trying to kill me and I want to live, uh, the next thing you have to do is you have to get yourself some equipment. You have to get yourself some tools to ensure your continued survival. Now, if your enemy has a 357, words are not going to get him up off your back. The only thing that can deal with that is another 357 or another gun. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. The whole issue ain't about whether we should be nonviolent or, or, or violent. The issue goes much deeper than that. The issue goes to whether we want to live or we want to die. And we are all here today because we want to live. We want to live. That's where that's at. The logic, the logic that dictates the actions of the pigs is so perverted and so depraved that they think that they can intimidate people. They think that they can frighten people off by simply shooting at them, shooting them down and locking them up. The pigs think that they can use violence to crush and destroy uh, 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 the determination of a people to be free. The pigs got to be crazy because, in fact, all that they do is, when they shoot down brothers and sisters in cold blood, when they concoct false conspiracy indictments and throw righteous brothers and sisters in jail, when they do that, in fact, all they do is awaken more people as to the reality of what's happening in America. With each bullet that they plunge into the body of a revolutionary, 10 more revolutionaries are born. Every time. This is a very unique situation that we are in, a very unique situation. Nowhere in the pages of any history book can you find a parallel situation. Because not only in America do we have a, a, a class struggle against uh, uh, those who have and those who have not, the gots and the don't have, but we also have a struggle that is manifesting itself along ethnic lines. We also have a struggle that is manifesting itself along the lines of sex. We also have a struggle that is manifesting itself along the lines of age. We have a hell of a struggle going on here, a hell of a struggle. A lot of us have what you might call a fog perspective or a tunnel perspective. We see ourselves as being black, so we think that we are oppressed and exploited uh, exclusively for that reason, only because we are black. Others are homosexuals, and they think that they are exploited and oppressed only because they are homosexuals. Uh, women think that they are exploited and oppressed only because they are women, and so on down the line. But when we check out the situation, and they also think that their freedom can only be gotten by, by, by waging it within their own specific area. But when we check out the situation, we find that the same, the same beasts who are exploiting women, the same beasts who are exploiting black people, the same beasts who are exploiting everybody else in this country, you know, is the same beasts. Now, so we got, so we got to answer this question. Now, if it is the same forces, if it's the same beast who's perpetrating all of these inhuman crimes, how can we best overcome that? What can we do about that? Right on, right on. I think everybody agrees on that. But we got to do it collectively. We got to do it together. We got to do it together. One of the tools, one of the psychological tricks that America has used in order to keep people divided and to keep them from uniting and forming a common front against a common enemy is the concept of individualism, of individualism. They've got us thinking that whatever we want, whatever we are lacking can be gained by pursuing it along individual lines. But when we check it out, we find that anyone in this society who is ex uh, exploited, oppressed, and persecuted, when they attempt to correct that situation by moving along an individual line, all that happens is they get shot down individually. That's all that happens. But on the other hand, if we begin moving in a unified and collective fashion, we will find that the results will be quite different, quite simply because there are more people than there are pigs, and everybody knows except the pigs, and the pigs know it, but they don't want to realize it. We know goddamn well that the spirit of the people is greater than the pigs' technology. We know that. We know that. We know that. And those of us who don't know that the only way we can get our freedom is by moving collectively, they better sit down and think about it. They better sit down and think about it. And they better check out a little history, too. In fact, they can start by checking out what happened back in Nazi Germany. 
because there was a situation wherein you had 63% of the population opposed to Nazi beast Adolf Hitler. You had 63% of the population, but he got in there. Why? Why? Because the various groups that were opposed to him were not opposing him in a unified fashion. They had various political parties and various trade union parties who were fighting each other. The so-called communists over there were fighting the social democrats, and the social democrats were fighting the labor unions. Everybody was fighting everybody else, and when they looked up, it was January the 30th, 1933, and Adolf Hitler was the chancellor of Germany, and it was too late, too late, too goddamn late. That's what happened. That's what happened. We have too many historical examples to reflect back upon that clearly tell us what happens when a people wait too long and when they refuse to bury their individual petty differences and unite around the fact that they are being exploited and oppressed by, by, by a common oppressor. It was some old reactionary Spanish philosopher who said something very hip to the effect of that uh, uh, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat its mistakes. And we can't afford to do that. We can't afford to do that. Because we have to understand once fa fascism is a reality in this country now, but we also have to understand that what we're witnessing now is nothing but a preliminary bout. The main event hasn't even started yet. This is nothing but a dress rehearsal. We ain't seen nothing yet. And every day that we wait, every day that we, that we vacillate, every day that we shuck and jive and argue over petty differences amongst ourselves only enables our oppressors to tighten up their hand and to be able to more effectively exterminate us. We don't have no time to be wasting. We don't have no time to be wasting. When we say seize the time, we mean, in fact, seize the time, seize the time. This is what we mean. When we say seize the time, we also mean that if you don't seize the time, the time will seize you. That's what will happen. That's what will happen. The time seized those people in Germany who said they were against Hitler. It not only did the time seize them, but the time put them in concentration camps and in gas chambers. The time also seized uh, I don't 400,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto because there we have a very valid historical example. There we have a situation where on one hand Adolf Hitler came out point blank. Make no mistake about it, he didn't pull no punches. Way back in 1925 in Mein Kampf, he told everybody what he was going to do. He told everybody what he was going to do. And he put 400,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. And he told them that we are going to exterminate you. We are going to exterminate you. And to prove that he was going to exterminate them, he was shipping them out at the rate of 10,000 a day. 10,000 a day, sending them to extermination camps such as Auschwitz. And that population of 400,000 decimated all the way down to 50,000 until that remaining 50,000 looked around at each other and said, God damn, you know what? I think Hitler is serious. He's going to kill us. <laughs> they waited too goddamn long. That was the problem. They fought heroically. The fight that they put up was a monument, was a testimony to the will of a people to survive, but it still doesn't obviate the fact that they waited too long. Now, what we find happening in America today is that too many people are waiting too long. Too many people are waiting for the concentration camps to be open. The concentration camps are open. What you think Allenwood is? That's a concentration camp. They got people in Allenwood. El Rio down in Oklahoma, that's a concentration camp. Avon Park down in Florida, it's a concentration camp. Tall Lake uh, uh, in California, Wickensburg in Florence, down there in Arizona, that's a concentration camp. They, America even has its own Siberia up in Alaska, they call it El Mendroff, that's a concentration camp. And people are in those places already, and there's still people walking around here talking about, well, I don't think we got fascism in this country because I don't see no concentration camps, because I don't see no concentration camps. All you have to do is open up your eyes and look at the black colony of Harlem, look at the black colony of Watts, look at the black colony of North Philadelphia, in which Temple University sits in the middle of. You know, too many people running around here thinking that the only place you have political prisoners are in the so-called Shaw sure Enough penitentiaries. That's bull. Every man, woman, and child in this country who is exploited, oppressed, and who has been dehumanized is, in fact, a political prisoner. That is what they are. That is what they are. <laughs>
Brother Huey P. Newton, the Minister of Defense and Supreme Commander of the Black Panther Party, put it very eloquently, Jack, and very down to earth when he made, uh, when he pointed out that the only difference between San Quentin and Fillmore in San Francisco, the only difference between Harlem and Sing Sing State Penitentiary is that one is a maximum security penitentiary and the other one is a minimum security penitentiary. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. When you look at the guards, you know, who drive up and down the streets of our community, you know, in blue uniforms or in gray uniforms or in whatever color uniform they may wear in their particular city. When you look at them, uh, you have to be some kind of brainwashed or uh, some kind of spaced out or insane to believe that they are actually there to protect you because we know they're not. We know they're not. When we look at the police who ride through our communities, we know that they are there for one reason and one reason only, and that is to guarantee that we don't get out of our places. And if we do get out of our places, they shoot us down in cold blood. That's the only reason they're there, to pit and to make sure we stay there. There's no difference between a guard in San Quentin, a pig in San Quentin, and a pig who rides in a police car in Fillmore. There's no difference. Both of them are doing the same job before the same people, so there's no difference. We have a situation where all the military and the economic power of this society rests in the hands of approximately 500,000 people. 500,000 people. Now, there are something like uh, 206 million people in this country. I think 500,000 is about one fourth for one percent. That one fourth for one percent controls about 95 percent of all of the wealth in this country. I would have to say that that would be, that that would be a clear-cut illustration of, of inequality and uh, unequal distribution. You know, that's unequal distribution. Whenever you have all the power over here resting in the hands of a small minority and all of the masses of the people over here are dead, broke, and wallowing in the muck and mire of impoverishment and destitution, that, uh, that is a messed up situation that has to be changed. That has to be changed. And that's what, we here, that's what we're down here for today. That's what we've come together for today. Because we have said to ourselves and to each other that too long, too goddamn long has this madness been going down. And we have to understand that nobody is going to stop it but us. And if we are not going to take the initiative, if we are not going to move in the direction, if we are not going to move to end right now and bring to a grinding halt the diesel train of fascism that is growing across the land, if we don't derail that train right now, look here, come the end of the 20th century, Jack, we ain't going to be around. We ain't going to be around. We all going to be dead. And if you think it can't happen, all you got to do is look back through the pages of history because it has happened time and time again, time and time again. And we can't afford to let that happen now. So we are down here today to put our heads together, to put our minds together, and to begin the process of drafting a new document, a new constitution that will, in fact, that will, in reality, serve as the legal basis for this society a document that will transform radically and revolutionarily this entire society, a document that in the end will result in the power being placed in the hands of the people where it should have been from Jump Street, but where it has never been. We are all about creating a document that will enable our brothers and sisters, everybody in this society, to have gainful employment, to have enough to eat. When we check out, the various economic systems existing today, we find that the only one that is capable of guaranteeing, guaranteeing gainful employing, uh, employment, the only one that is capable of guaranteeing that people will be able to live in homes that are fit for, for the shelter of human beings are, are the only economic system that is capable of guarantee, guaranteeing the people the right to determine the cost of their own destiny and that is capable of guaranteeing the people the right of determining what is made, how it is made, and how it is distributed is the socialistic form of government, the socialistic system. That's the only kind, the only kind. <laughs> and so we see today that the present system of government is the exact opposite of what we want the exact opposite. We're going to take this Constitution that is presently in existence and we're going to render it null and void. It ain't no good. It ain't never been no good. We don't need it. We got to get rid of it. That's what that boils down to. We are, we are, we're going to sit down and we're going to draw up a document that says if you constitute 
40% of the population or 30% of the population, then you deserve 30% of the wealth. If you constitute 10%, then you deserve 10%. That's what pro proportional representation is all about. That's what it's all about. It's not about a small handful of depraved and demented pigs owning everything at the expense of the people. That if it's 30, uh, 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 30 percent, if the population is 30% black people, then they should own 30% of Standard Oil. They should own 30% of General Motors. They should control 30% of the seats in the House of Representatives and in the uh, and in the Senate. We are saying that if we are 30% of the population, we want 30% of all the action. America is very uptight today over the fact that so many people have guns. They don't want people to have guns because they know that once the people are armed, they are then in a position. They are then in a position to move against those who are oppressing and exploiting them. Why can't Mao Zedong get down wrong in China if he wanted to? Because there are 700 million Chinese over there and they all got guns. They all got guns. What is the guarantee that the brothers and sisters in North Korea will be properly represented? Uh, what is the guarantee they have that, uh, uh, that Kim Song uh, and the other brothers over there will not oppress and exploit them? That guarantee is that the people are armed. They are armed. The Second Amendment of the Constitution of this country gives everyone a right to bear arms, a right to bear arms. But at the same time, the pigs are uptight now, and they dig that the people are going to be using those guns to get their freedom. So what are they talking about? They're saying you ain't got no right to bear arms. They say that's they sure. We need more than we need more than arms that are just capable of holding little babies. We don't. We, we need more than those kind of arms. We need arms that are capable of emanating bullets that are capable of plunging into the body of depraved and demented beasts. Arms that will uh, 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 kill those pigs. That's the kind of arms we need. We need arms, 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 and some more arms. We need as many arms as we can get. Because without those arms, we're going to find our asses in a flam. They talk about uh, uh, black people are getting violent. White radicals are getting violent. And violence is wrong. This is what they say. They have confused and befogged that issue to such an extent that a lot of people are really going for that. But we say that violence manifests itself in a number of manners. We also say that there are basically and fundamentally, when you get right down to it, two forms of violence. There is what we term reactionary violence. That is the violence that is used by the oppressor to keep the oppressed in a state of subjugation and enslavement. And then there is revolutionary violence. That is violence that is used by those who are oppressed and exploited for the purpose of getting the oppressor up off of their backs. We say that the latter form of violence, revolutionary violence, is justified and should be endorsed and should be indulged in by every man, woman, and child who is concerned with freedom. And we say that the former form of violence, reactionary violence, is a crime against humanity. We say that when Heron is flooded into the black community and when seven and eight year old black, uh, black uh, boys and girls are dying from ODs, we say that that is a form of violence. We say that forcing a people to live under barbaric and inhuman conditions where the plaster is falling off the wall and where little boys and little girls eat that plaster and incur lead poisoning, which leads to mental retardation and permanent brain damage, that that's a form of violence. We say that when you go into the store and you are charged 10 times what the item is really worth, that is a form of violence. We say that, and beyond a doubt, when a pig rolls up on a black person or, or, or any person in this society and shoots them down in cold blood, that that is a form of violence. And we say that anything we do to defend ourselves against that reactionary violence is justified, and that's what we should be off into. That's what that boils down to. We ain't even gonna get hung up over whether we gonna be violent or not because the fact of the matter is we don't have no choice. So we're gonna get together today and we're gonna put this thing into motion. And the end result of it is gonna be a new society. Not only is it gonna be a new society, but it's gonna be a new world. It's gonna be a new world and we have to see it in those terms because the entire fate of mankind the fate and the destiny of humanity is dependent upon, to a very, very large extent, 
how effectively we do our job here today and in the following days to come. The fate of humanity rests upon us. All power to the people and right on. Workshops scheduled for Saturday afternoon were canceled because of the late hour when the session concluded. Excitement remained high as the delegates anticipated the arrival of Huey P. Newton, the Minister of Defense and Supreme Commander of the Black Panther Party, who was scheduled to deliver his keynote address at 8 p.m. For Huey's speech, security was particularly tight. In addition to the registered convention delegates, many people from the Philadelphia community turned out to hear the address, and the crowd swelled to over 15,000. At most, 10,000 people could be accommodated in the university gymnasium, and as a result, thousands of people were unable to hear the Supreme Commander speak. Virtually all of the accredited press was excluded from the hall, apparently because of a mishap in logistical arrangements. The event was broadcast live by the Temple University radio station, WRTI-FM. Through the courtesy of that station, we were able to present in full the keynote address by Huey P. Newton. So I bring you Huey P. Newton, the Minister of Defense, and our Supreme Commander. I applaud you because you're all such beautiful people, and the power is with you. And as soon as we realize that, we will make many changes. Matter of fact, we will transform the world. The power is not with the Black Panther Party. The power is not with any individual. But you have the power collectively. You can move things. You can even move Bozo. And you can also move tape. Today is the occasion for the plenary session leading up to our Constitutional Convention. This will be the first People's Revolutionary Constitution, Constitutional Convention ever held in this country. We do not recognize the one in 1777 because we know that it did not represent us, it did not represent the people, but it only represented a small ruling circle even at that time. We look for refuge in the law, we look for refuge in the Constitution, but we find none. We find none because we realize that constitutions have no force. We realize that laws do not shoot bullets. People do. We want control of that power that is able to hurt us, and it's surely not on paper. That power is, in, is entrenched in the ownership of the land and the institutions thereof. What we want to do here tonight is to start to establish an institution through which we can express our revolutionary spirit. At this time, there's none. We can't find it in electoral politics. We can't find it in any arena that's been developed by the reactionary racist ruling circle. So I shall read to you the preamble to our Constitution starting out with the declaration that you're all very familiar with. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're bound, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, then it is the right of the people to alter or abolish, to alter and abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form 
as events should seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate the government's long established should not be changed for light and transit causes. And accordingly, all experience have shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Our sufferings have been long and patient. Our prudence has stayed this final hour. But our human dignity and strength requires that we steal the voice of prudence with the cries of our suffering. Thus we gather in the spirit of revolutionary love and friendship for all oppressed people of the world, regardless of their race or of the race and doctrine of their oppressor. We gather to proclaim to the world that for 200 years, we have suffered this long train of abuses and usurpations while holding to the hope that this will pass. We recognize, however, that it has not passed, and we're a people who enjoy no equal protection of the law, no due process of the law, and our future action must be guided by our sufferings, not by our prudence. Two centuries ago, when the United States was a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the conditions prevailed in the nation, and the assumption on which its foundation were built was such that they ensured that the United States would come to its maturity under circumstances which mean that for a substantial proportion of citizens, life is nothing more than a living death. Liberty is nothing more than a prison of poverty. And the only happiness we enjoy is laughing to keep from crying. The United States of America was born at a time when the nation covered relatively little land, a narrow strip of political division on the eastern seaboard. The United States of America was born at a time when the population was small and fairly homogeneous, both racially and culturally. Thus, the people called Americans were a different people in a different place. Furthermore, they had a different economic system. The small population and the fertile lands available meant that with the agricultural emphasis of the economy, people were able to advance according to their motivation and ability. It was an agricultural economy, and with the circumstances around it, democratic capitalism flourished in the new nation. The following years were to see this new nation rapidly develop into a giant. The new nation acquired land and spread from a narrow strip on the eastern seaboard to cover the entire continent, but with few exceptions. The new nation acquired a population to fill this newly acquired land. The population was drawn from the continents of Africa, Asia, Europe, and South America. Thus, a nation conceived by a homogeneous people of a small number and in a small area grew into a nation of a heterogeneous people, comprised a large number and spread across an entire continent. This change in the fundamental characteristics of the nation and its people substantially changed the nature of American society. Furthermore, the social change was marked by economic changes. A rural and agricultural economy became an all, um, urban and industrialized economy as farming was replaced by manufacturing. The democratic capitalism of the early days became caught up in a relentless drive to obtain profits and more profits until the selfish motivation for profits eclipsed the unselfish principles of democracy. Thus, 200 years later, we have an older, overdeveloped economy which is so infused with the need for profit that we have replaced democratic capitalism with bureaucratic capitalism. The 
free opportunity of all men to pursue their economic ends have been replaced by constraints placed upon Americans by large corporations which control and direct our economy. They have sought to increase their profits at the expense of the people, and particularly at the expense of racial and ethnic minorities. The history of the United States has distinguished from the promise of the idea of the United States leads us to the conclusion that our suffering is basic to the functioning of the government of the United States. We see, the, we see this when we know that basic contradictions found in the history of this nation, the government, the social conditions, and the legal documents which brought freedom from oppression, which brought human dignity and human rights to one portion of our people of this nation, have entirely opposite consequences for another portion of the people. While the majority group achieved their basic human rights, the, the minority achieved alienation of the lands of their fathers and slavery. The evidence from this is clear and incontrovertible. We find evidence for majority freedom and minority oppression in the fact that the expansion of the United States government and the acquisition of land was at the uh, unjust expense of the American Indians, the original possessors of the land and still its legitimate heirs. The long march of the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears and the actual disappearance of many other Indian nations testified to the unwillingness and inability of this government and this government's constitution to incorporate racial minorities. We find evidence for majority freedom and minority oppression in the fact that even while the early settlers were proclaiming their freedom, they were deliberately and systematically depriving Africans of their freedom. These basic contradictions were further aggravated by acts which implicitly admitted that the majority was wrong, but unwilling to do right. Thus, when the Declaration of Independence was drafted, the Founding Fathers struck all mentions of the, of the slave trades. Thus, when the United States Constitution was drafted, the Founding Fathers considered the slaves as, as equivalent to three-fifths of the man. Thus, when the slaves were emancipated, the descendants of the Founding Fathers compromised that freedom to gain further territory. These compromises were so basic to the thinking of the forebears that legal attempts to correct the contradictions through constitutional amendments and civil rights laws have produced no change in our conditions, and we are still a people without equal protection and due process of the law. We recognize then that the oppressive acts of the United States government, when contrasted with the testaments of freedom, carries forward a basic contradiction found in all the legal documents upon which this government is based. Generation after generation of the majority group have been born, they have worked, and they have seen the fruits of their labor in the life, liberty, and happiness of their children and grandchildren. Generation after generation of black people in America have been born, they have worked, and they have seen the fruits of their labors in the life, liberty, and happiness of the children and grandchildren of the oppressor. While while their own descendants wallow in the mire of poverty and, de and uh, deprivation, holding only to the hope of change in the future. The hope has sustained us for many years and has led us to suffer the administration of a corrupt government. At the dawn of the 20th century, this hope led us to formulate a civil rights, uh, a, a civil rights movement in the belief that the government would eventually fulfill its promise to black people. We did not recognize, however, that any attempts to complete the promise of the 18th century revolution in the framework of a 20th century government, economy, and society was doomed to failure. The descendants of that small company of original settlers of this land are not among the common people of today. They have become a small ruling class in control of a worldwide economic system. The constitution set up by their ancestors to serve the people no longer serves the people for the people have changed. The people of the 18th century have become the ruling circle of the 20th century, and the people of the 20th century are the descendants of the slaves and the dispossessed of the 18th century. The 
Constitution set up to serve the people of the 18th century now serves the ruling circle of the 20th century. And the people of today stand wanting for a foundation for their own life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. The Civil Rights Movement has not produced this foundation, and it cannot produce this foundation because of the nature of the United States society and economy. The version of the Civil Rights Movement, the vision of the Civil Rights Movement is to achieve goals which have been altered by 200 years of change. Thus, the Civil Rights Movement and similar movements have produced no foundation for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They have produced humiliating programs of welfare and unemployment compensation. Programs uh, with sufficient form to deceive the people, but with insufficient substance to change the fundamental distribution of power and resources in this country. Moreover, while the movements attempt to get minorities into the system, we note that the government continues its pattern of practice which contradicts its de democratic rhetoric. We recognize now that we see history repeating itself, but on an international as well as a national scale. The relentless drive for profit led this nation to colonize, oppress, and exploit its minorities. This profit drive took this nation from domestic, uh, democratic capitalism and underdevelopment to bureaucratic capitalism and overdevelopment. Now we see that the small ruling circle continues its profit drive by oppressing and exploiting the people of the world. Throughout the world, the proletariat is crushed so that the profits of the American industry can continue to flow. Throughout the world, the freedom struggle of oppressed people are opposed by this government because they are a threat to the bureaucratic capitalism of the United States of America. We gather here to let it be known at home and abroad that a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness has in its maturity become an imperialistic power dedicated to death, oppression, and the pursuit of profits. We will not be deceived by so many of our fellow men. We will not be blinded by small changes in form which lack any change in substance of the imperialist expansion. Our suffering has been too long. Our sacrifices have been too great. And our human dignity is too strong for us to be prudent any longer. The Black Panther Party calls for freedom and power to determine our destiny. The Black Panther Party calls for full employment for all our people. The Black Panther Party calls for an end to the capitalistic exploitation of our community. The Black Panther Party calls for decent housing for all people. The Black Panther Party calls for an educational system that will tell us the true facts about this decadent society. The Black Panther Party calls for exception from the military service. The Black Panther Party calls for an end to police brutality. The Black Panther Party calls for freedom for all political prisoners and prisoners of war. The Black Panther Party calls for trials by members of our peer when we're brought to the court, and justice. The Black Panther Party calls for a United Nations plebiscite to determine the will of black people as to their national destiny. Black people and oppressed people in general have lost faith in leaders of America and the government of America and the very structure of the American government, that is the Constitution, its legal foundation. This loss of faith is based upon the overwhelming evidence that this government will not live according to the Constitution because the Constitution is not designed for its people. For this reason, we assemble a constitutional convention to consider rational and positive alternatives. Alternatives which will place their emphasis on the common man. Alternatives which will bring about a new economic system in which the rewards as well as the work will be equally shared by all people, a socialist framework. Alternatives which will guarantee that within the socialist framework, all groups will be adequately represented in decision-making and administration which affect their lives. Alternatives which will guarantee that all men will attain their full manhood rights that they will be able to live, be free, 
and seek out those goals which will give them respect and dignity while permitting the same privileges for every other man, regardless of his condition or status. The sacredness of man and of the human spirit requires that human dignity and integrity ought to always be respected by every other man. We will sell for nothing less, or at this point in history, anything less is but a living death. We're here to say to this government of the United States that we will be free. And we're here to ordain a new constitution which will ensure our freedom by enshrining the dignity of the human spirit. The people here tonight are responsible for the release of the 15 community members who were abused and mistreated by Bozo. And we should say, when any one of you, when any one of you is abused, then we should consider it uh, an abuse of all of us. We also would like to say that we feel it is criminal for one people to reduce another people to such a level that they can only express their political grievances through violence. We say that the man who stripped us of our, of our community and of our institutions and of our family relationships, the man who stripped us of our human dignity by slavery, he is the man who is responsible for the violence. He is the same man who is now attempting to strip all other third world people of their dignity and of their wealth through stripping their nation of their natural resources in order to feed the monster factories here in North America. We notice when these people of the third world use self-defense, then the oppressor says he doesn't understand why, why they're so bad. The fact is that the people are never violent. That the violence is only related to aggression. Self-defense is related to oppression. So we would like for this uh, city to know, the government of the city, to know, and also the government of the United States, to know that we will not tolerate any longer the abuse that we've tolerated for many years. It is a fact that we will get change. We will transform the society. It is up to the oppressor to decide whether this will be a peaceful thing or Whatever, we will use whatever means that is effective, regardless of the consequence, because it is our conclusion and our principle that a slave who dies a natural death will not balance two dead flies on the scales of eternity. <laughs> level the face of the earth in an attempt again. So I would like to say that we are one tonight. Let us be one in the future. Power to all of the people.
While Huey spoke inside, the crowds outside were told that he would appear at 10.30 p.m. at the Church of the Advocate. As a result, that evening, several thousand people jammed the streets surrounding the church in the heart of North Philadelphia. Many people waited as long as two hours to get a glimpse of the Supreme Commander, but Huey never arrived. The Panthers explained that the crowd in the streets posed too great a security risk. Meanwhile, splinter groups organized a few fragmentary marches through the streets, some led by groups of bongo and conga players. One group considered marching through downtown Philadelphia to City Hall several miles away. The Panthers, using public address equipment in the vicinity of the church, reminded the crowd that the convention was called to draft a constitution, not for street demonstrations. In a Panther statement the next morning, the street demonstrations were blamed on cultural nationalist provocateurs. After it was announced that Huey would not be able to visit the church, the crowd peacefully disbanded. The ecology of agriculture should be cons consistent with ecology for the health of the people and the preservation of the land. Food should be organic. Sunday afternoon, over a dozen workshops were held, each one concentrating on one political issue that demanded attention in the new constitution. Workshops were devoted to self-determination for national minorities, self-determination for women, self-determination for homosexuals, self-determination for street people, control and use of the military, control and use of the educational system, control and use of the land, distribution of political power, and internationalism, among others. At the final mass meeting of the plenary session on Sunday night, reports from each of the workshops were read to the assembled delegates, and most of the reports were received enthusiastically with little dissension or disagreement expressed. The reports were not in the form of articles for the new constitution, but rather were recommendations and proposals for the document's contents when it is drafted in final form later this year. Here are excerpts from the workshop reports recorded in the convention hall. A national policy should be determined to minimize the exploitation of power resources. Within a given region, a balance must be preserved between wild areas, recreation areas, agriculture, industry, and urban concentration. Things taken from the earth should be recycled either back into the earth or into other usable things. Present political boundaries, such as states, municipalities, and the like, will be abolished and replaced by a number, and I should say an indeterminate number, of autonomous, continuously evolving, self-governing communities from which power will flow upward all offices will be elective, and the people's right of recall is sacred. All special privileges are forbidden. Leaders will receive no special prerogatives. There will be no compulsory servitude or domination of one group by another. Since correct information is basic to the political process, the people will have unrestricted access to the media. The people will police and defend themselves which means community control of the police and army. The people are capable of defining their own needs. They will define those needs in workers' councils, community councils, and a national economic council, which will draw up a coordinated economic plan, which will rationalize and integrate all local production in the country. There must be a prompt inventory of all production to determine that which is socially useful and that which is repetitive or useless. The people's government will enter into economic relations with the revolutionary governments of the third world, relations which are based on justice and whose purpose will be to share the world's wealth with all the peoples. The workers will control the actual process of production in the factory. They will decide how to achieve the norms of the Central Economic Planning Committee. Firing workers will not be used to get rid of them since that would just send them to another sector of our socialist economy. Our priority should be to work with the individual and to re-educate him to become a contributing member of our new society. The special rights of small entrepreneurs, skilled craftsmen, etc., should be respected. They will be allowed to continue in the pursuit of their livelihood as long as they do not exploit others. The Constitution should guarantee employment for everyone and an opportunity for all perks people to learn a productive skill. Leaders must engage in factory or similar work. Special compensation and status will be afforded to workers in difficult, dirty, or especially boring jobs. The workers have the right to shut down or change any operation which they feel is unsafe. All workers will be guaranteed 
free housing, free transportation, free medical care, free child care, and free education. In conclusion, workers must be armed and organized to protect their social gains. Free legal aid for the people, such as lawyers, etc. All people will be provided with the kind of schooling they desire and need. All levels of schooling will be provided free by the government. Schooling must be non-competitive and non-compulsory. We recognize that hard drugs, smack, speed, etc., are counter-revolutionary. <laughs> Seller of hard drugs must be educated or eradicated from the community by any means necessary. The user must be helped to rid himself of addiction by the people. We urge setting up people rehabilitation centers by the people. We recognize that psychedelic drugs such as acid and mescaline and grass are instrumental in developing the revolutionary conscience of people. <laughs> After this revolutionary consciousness has been achieved, these drugs may become a burden. No revolutionary action should be attempted while under the influence, the influence of any drug. We urge that these drugs be made legal. That is, there should be no law against their use. The convention began to disband on Sunday night, but there were enough delegates left on Monday afternoon to hold a meeting in the Church of the Advocate, attended by about a thousand people, to discuss additional issues and proposals for the new constitution, and to decide tentatively on a site for the actual constitutional convention ratifying session, which is scheduled for November 4th, election day. The groups tentatively decide to reconvene in Washington, D.C. on November 4th. Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention plenary session accomplished most of what it set out to do. It assembled hundreds of proposals for a new American constitution aimed at eliminating oppression and instituting a socialist government. But beyond that, it provided an opportunity for revolutionaries of all stripes, blacks and whites, men and women, homosexuals and heterosexuals, foreign and domestic, to unite in a common effort to achieve social change. And it demonstrated that the revolutionary movement in America has become strong enough to openly assemble thousands of its followers in a major city and to defend itself against threats from its adversaries. This is Bruce Soloway reporting.